reading from the first book of Kings. The brook near where Elijah was hiding ran dry because no rain had fallen in the land. So the Lord said to Elijah, move on to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have designated a widow there to provide for you. He left and went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was gathering sticks there. He called out to her, please bring me a small cupful of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, please bring along a bit of bread. She answered, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There is only a handful of flour in my jar and a little oil in my jug. Just now I was collecting a couple of sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. When we have eaten it, we shall die. Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you propose, but first make me a little cake and bring it to me. Then you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour shall not go empty nor the jug of oil run dry until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She left and did as Elijah had said. She was able to eat for a year, and Elijah and her son as well. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, as the Lord had foretold through Elijah. The word of the Lord. Lord, let your face shine on us. When I call, answer me, O my just God. You who relieve me when I am in distress, have pity on me and hear my prayer. Men of rank, how long will you be dull of heart? Why do you love what is vain and seek after falsehood? Know that the Lord does wonders for his faithful one. The Lord will hear me when I call upon him. Tremble and sin not. Reflect upon your beds in silence. O oh Lord, let the light of your countenance shine upon us. You put gladness into my heart more than when grain and wine abound. Dominus Fobiscum. Et cus Dei tutum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthaeum. Gloria Tibi Domine. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? 
It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Verbum Domini. Saturday afternoon, I was wondering what's showing on EWTN and uh, found out they had an EWTN on location event. And I always enjoy those because there's always some very interesting uh, talks that are given. And on this particular uh, conference that was the Given Institute Forum, the Given Institute is a group that helps young adult women to realize their gifts and to utilize them for the church and for the world. And so this was a forum addressing especially young adult women. And the speaker that I especially enjoyed, of, of all of them, I enjoyed their talks, was one by Luan Zurlo. Luan Zurlo. And she's re recently written a book called Single for a Greater Purpose. She herself is single. It was something that was a struggle for her, something that uh, she prayed about. And uh, in her book, that book, Single for a Greater Purpose, she talked about how she prayed you know, for years. She said, I spent years asking God to send me a spouse like St. Joseph. And then I prayed for patience, then holy indifference, and then that I might embrace God's will for my life rather than my own will. It finally became clear to me that Jesus was calling me to himself. Now my prayers are filled with heartfelt thanks. I thank God over and over for this privileged, joy-filled vocation, and I count myself extraordinarily blessed. Through it all, it was Jesus who had the greatest patience with me. And uh, so in this book, she talks about some quite astounding statistics today. She said the number of singles in society and in the church has exploded. The U.S. Census Bureau reported that in 2015, there were 109 million, 45% of American adults, who are unmarried, of whom 69 million have never been married. So in the United States today, 109 million people are unmarried, are single. 69 million of them have never been married. To compare, in 1950, some 33% of American adults were unmarried. So there's nearly 50 million more American adults who are single and never married than there were two generations ago. So obviously, this is a large part of the community, of our church, and we, we know them uh, and how they enrich the church through their lives. And so this book is a lot about living that single state, but in a dedicated way, a dedicated way to God. And she talks about different sociological factors that have led to this increased explosion of singles, uh, libertine sexual mores, broken homes, uh, not may, being able to make a commitment, those sorts of things. But then she asks a question, something that she discovered in her own life. Could there be another positive 
transcendent reason for the increase of singles. Might God be calling more Catholics to a deeper communion with him to live as lay celibates and bring gospel values to a sex-crazed, increasingly secularized culture? Because in our media world, words don't have that much value, significance. Yes, they do. But it's kind of devalued because we have so many words thrown at us and so many opinions and untruths and so on. She says, what catches the attention of a distracted world are lives authentically and joyfully lived. Authentically and joyfully lived. When they see that that person has joy, that there is a, a, just a, a peace within them, there is a purpose, there is a meaning in their lives, and that's radiant in their life, that they have the light of Christ in them. As he said in today's gospel, you are the light of the world, and let that light be shine before men. She goes into the whole debate of whether the single state is a vocation or not, talking about that, but she says, you know, really the essential thing for all of us as followers of Christ is our baptism, living out our baptism in whatever state that is, as ordained, religious, married, or single, the baptism is that which forms the whole of our life, being followers of Christ, being salt in this world, being light in the world, salt that adds flavor to life and preserves, as it does you know, in a natural sense, and that light that we are called to radiate of Christ to the world. So she asks, might joyful, dedicated singles living outwardly normal lives, woven into the fabric of secular life, serve as a relevant witness to many parts of our culture? So living out their own life, she herself, um, Luann is a professor at Catholic University about, uh, in finances. And so living that vocation out in her own role of teaching, in her own service to the church, there was an article in the uh, Register this past March by another single woman, Mary Schwartz, and she talks about her own struggles in embracing what the Lord was calling her to, living as a dedicated single, not just a single whose options are always open, but living as a dedicated single, single living for God, serving God in that state. So she said that she was living in New York and as she would ride on the bus, she would always have a knockdown, drag out fight with God over being single. And she was reading that classic, perhaps you've heard of it, The Abandonment of, Div of Divine Providence. Abandonment to Divine Providence. You know, Father Groeschel told me once he read something from that every day, practically. Abandonment to Divine Providence in which this book talks about that nothing happens to us that God doesn't will or permit. And we must accept his will in everything if we're to grow in holiness. And Mary, in her singleness, she said, how I hated that book. It was a bitterly difficult struggle. But when I was finally able to say yes to God, I found joy and fulfillment as a single woman. I've met many young Catholic women who are longing to marry and struggling even to find someone to date. Knowing the suffering, the inability to find a spouse entailed, my heart went out to them. And so then she talks about her own, um, how we are all called to love, that God has revealed himself not only as a parent caring for children, but as a bridegroom in love with the bride. And she quotes St. Teresa of Calcutta, who said, Jesus saying, I thirst, something they have in every, all of their chapels, as I mentioned in a previous homily, I thirst 
is something much deeper than Jesus just saying, I love you, I thirst. St. Teresa said that boy and girl who fall in love with each other, that love is, I thirst. You have to experience it. So Mary says, God doesn't just love us, but he is in love with us. And we are right to long to be in love. That's what we're made for. But even married people must wait until heaven to experience being in love for more than brief periods of their lives, if they experience it at all. But men and women who are unmarried against their will should know that if by the grace of the Holy Spirit they are able to consent to the cross of being single now, not knowing whether they will ever find a spouse, they are likely to grow in intimacy with him and begin to experience God's love in contemplative prayer and the joy that comes with it. She talks about the two conversions that spiritual writers speak of. The first conversion is, I'm deciding I'm going to follow the Lord. But then the second one happens, she says, as spiritual writers point out, and she quotes Father Groeschel in his book, Spiritual Passages. When a person's most cherished dreams may lie in ruins, he or she might be abandoned by a spouse, a child might die, his or her religious order may fall apart, or he or she may be unmarried against their will. But as the saying goes, it's always darkest just before the dawn. If they persevere in authentic prayer, the Holy Spirit will give them the grace of this second conversion of trust and hope and being able to say with Christ, even through gritted teeth, not my will but thine be done. And then everything begins to change. It's like the resurrection on Easter morning, Father Groeschel writes. Eventually, one begins to experience his or her nuptial relationship with God. So Mary goes on to talk about her own experience. And she said, I can still remember where I was standing, look out, looking out a window, when the thought that God was calling me to celibacy first came. Could it be, I thought, that after all this time, after all these decades of wanting and waiting for a spouse, it had become just me and Jesus? And so she went into a, a time of discernment with her spiritual director. And one day, in a time of Eucharistic adoration, I told the Lord that I was going to make a vow of celibacy in front of the Blessed Sacrament and was filled with a supernatural joy that persisted for days. Since that time, a fruitful apostolate and many other signs have affirmed my head and my heart in this decision. So it was a, it's a private vow. It's not a, a public vow like consecrated religious make, like we make, but a private vow of dedication. And how God uses that. I can think, you know, here at EWTN, we have many dedicated singles. I don't know that they've made a private vow of that sort, but I know that there are many who have been able to just give their whole selves to this apostolate toward its fruitfulness for you, ultimately, for the church, for souls, for God, for the love of God. And how beautiful that is, even in my own life, my godfather, I remember that he would come and help dad on the farm. He was a bachelor carpenter, but he was very dear to me and uh, a dear friend to me throughout my, li my young life. And how he helped my own father because he had the freedom to be able to do that. And I think that's as um, Luann says in her own book, she says, they're free agents. <laughs> you know, they, they're not, um, have the responsibilities of a family, they don't have responsibilities of religious life, they're free agents that God can use 
Finally, I'd like to conclude with also a word of encouragement, and this is in the foreword of Luan Zerlo's book by uh, his priest, Father Geertek, if I can find it here. Here it is. So Father, Father Geertek is a Dominican and a theologian of the papal household who wrote the foreword to her book. Here's what he wrote. It seems that now, <clears throat> In the face of difficulties in the world and in the church, which I need not describe, God is calling for an army of dedicated laity, living in the world with professional lives and lay lifestyles, but nourished from within by a personal encounter with him alone. The dedicated laity who are not priests and nuns, who do not wear religious habits, who are within the church congregation of an average parish and are true in their total dedication to God, are the leaven of new life. The church grows from within from the quality of the spiritual lives of individuals who exercise faith working through love. And more extraordinarily still, who support the theological virtues with a total, undivided, consecrated life. In this they receive no prize, no official garment, no special recognition, no respected social role, just one reward, a hidden spiritual joy.